Amen. All right, well, we're there in Exodus chapter number 20. I'd like you to keep your place there, if you would, and go with me to the book of Psalms, if you would. Keep your place right there in Exodus 20. We're going to come back to it here in a minute. But go with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm 89. If you open up your Bible just right in the center, you will more than likely fall in the book of Psalms, Psalm 89. And, of course, this morning we are going, we are continuing through a series entitled Mixing Politics and Religion. And uh, we are doing, I'm doing this series because we're getting ready to go into this election uh, uh, season, or we're in this election season, and this ser- series, these series are not about the candidates or endorsing anybody or anything like that, uh, but since we've got politics on our mind, I thought it'd be good to study, and I actually do this every four years on election uh, year, I preach the political type uh, series, and um, I thought it'd be good for us to learn about government, what the Bible teaches about government, and uh, last week I preached a sermon entitled, I Pledge Allegiance, and we learned about the fact that the Bible teaches that our allegiance should be to God completely. Uh, soul, heart, body, might, everything we have belongs to God. And our affection can be given to our countrymen, and there is limited authority that has been given to government. We'll talk more about that uh, next week. Today, I'm preaching on the subject of separation of church and state. And I think probably everyone in this room has heard that phrase, separation of church and state. And I'm preaching on that subject. And I want to begin by showing you this verse in Psalm 89 and verse 15. The Bible says this, Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. Notice what the Bible says. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. The Bible teaches that a people, and when you see that phrase there, the people, it's a reference to uh, the nation. Even our uh, documents, our founding documents, were referred to the country as we, the people. Uh, And here he says, blessed is the people that walk in the light of the countenance of God. God says that a nation, the Bible says, and this is just one verse, we could look at many verses and we will over the next several weeks, but the Bible teaches that a people... They are blessed uh, based on their attachment and their connection to God. So this idea of separation of church and state uh, is something that just from that verse we can see goes against God because the doctrine of separation of church and state says that we must separate government and our country from religion, from church, from God. But the Bible says that blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. So the people should walk in the light of God, not separate uh, from God. Now keep your place right there in Psalms, because we're going to come back to it, and go back with me to the book of Exodus. And while you turn there, let me just give you some uh, kind of introductory statements. First of all, I want to explain to you and kind of give you some context in regards to religious liberty in the United States of America. And specifically, when we refer to religious liberty, we are referring to, generally, to the First Amendment. Now, the First Amendment, and of course, you remember from school that uh, we have a constitution, and that constitution was given 10 initial amendments, more amendments after that, uh, that were meant to state the the rights of the people and, and really to limit government, to limit the government from what it can't uh, uh, do. And the First Amendment uh, says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably, uh, peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And, you know, when you read that First Amendment, it almost seems like there's all these random things put into there about not creating or establishing a religion and prohibiting, uh, not prohibiting the free exercise thereof and abridging freedom of speech and press and the right people, to, uh, uh, people uh, the right of the people uh, to peaceably assemble and uh, the right of the people to be able to basically rebuke the government and to uh, call out the government for grievances. Uh, the interesting thing, and I'm not teaching on the Constitution <laughs> this morning, although we're going to refer to it a lot. The interesting thing is that First Amendment, honestly, if you look at it, it it's all about <clears throat> religion. It's all about, because if you think about the fact that it's uh, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. That's something that we do as Bible-believing Christians. We preach the word of God 
or the right of the people uh, or of the press, or something that even we, and obviously that's usually applied to uh, like newspapers and media, but we use the press, we use uh, media, we use YouTube, right? We use those things, the right of the people to peaceably assemble, that's what we're doing right now, uh, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That's something, we'll talk about that next week, which is something that we are biblically supposed to do. Uh, and again, I'm not preaching on that, I just thought that was interesting, that as you look at all those things, they might seem random, but they're all actually connected to what we do as Christians. But the first part of the First Amendment is what's often referred to as uh, the religious liberty aspect. And I want you to understand this, and I, and I want you to understand this because I'm going I'm to, uh, we're going to get to the Bible here in a minute, uh, but I, I want you to understand kind of the context of where we're heading. That religious liberty aspect of the First Amendment is divided into two clauses. One is referred to as the Establishment Clause. The other one is referred to as the Free Exercise Clause, all right? So if you read the First Amendment, the first part of that religious liberty part says, Congress shall make no law respecting uh, an establishment of religion. That's the Establishment Clause. What that means is that the federal government was not allowed to establish a national religion, a national denomination. There's, they are prohibited from establishing um, a uh, religion. That's the establishment clause. Then the second part says, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That is the free exercise clause, meaning that they can't stop people from exercising their religion. So they can't establish religion uh, at a federal level, that's the Establishment Clause, and they can't stop people, or uh, uh, they, there's the Free Exercise Clause, they can't stop people from uh, exercising their religion. Again, this is, the Bi- this is not the Bible, this is the First Amendment, this is uh, the Constitution. I realize that most churches get those things mixed up, but they're actually different. The Bible and the documents of our founding nation are not the same thing, all right? Now, the reason that I bring this up, you say, I thought you were preaching about the separation of church and state. The reason that I bring up the First Amendment uh, and, and the religious liberty clauses of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause is because this phrase, separation of church and state, has been closely tied in to the religious liberty uh, 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 clause or aspects of the First Amendment. Let me just read to you uh, just a small little uh, tiny article from uh, Wikipedia, and this is just to show you kind of the current view in regards to this phrase, the separation of church and state. Here's how they explain it. Separation of church and state is paraphrased from Thomas Jefferson and used by others and, and we're going to get into separation of church and state, where that came from, that phrase. But this is how they explain it. They say it's paraphrased from Thomas Jefferson and used by others in expressing an understanding of the intent and function of the establishment and free exercise clause of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, which reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So here's what I want you to understand. When the... Founding fathers gave us the Constitution, and when the amendments were created, they created, they wrote in what we refer to today as the Establishment Clause or the Free Exercise Clause, that the federal government was prohibited from establishing a national religion, and they were prohibited from uh, uh, prohibiting the free exercise of religion. And then today... People refer to this separation of church and state phrase, and they'll say, well, that explains the First Amendment. That explains the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. So if you ask a judge today, you know, at the federal level or the Supreme Court, well, what what is separation of church and state? They'll say, well, that's the application of the First Amendment, the religious liberty uh, clauses, the, the application of the Establishment Clause and the application of the Free Exercise Clause is separation of church and state. It is how they say it, is, uh, the, it expresses an understanding of the intent and function of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. So with that in mind, let me uh, teach you this idea of separation of church and state, and, and, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, if you're able to write down some things, I'd like you to write these things down. You can uh, take some notes on the back of the course of the week. There's a place for you to write that down. If you go back to Exodus chapter 20, keep your place in Psalms, and uh, let me just give you uh, several points this morning. Number one, in regards to separation of church and state, 
Separation of church and state is not a concept found in Scripture. Now, I know saying that hurts all these patriotic, God bless America Christians, but you need to, look, if you're going to be a Bible-believing Christian, if you're going to be a Baptist, which means that we are Biblicists, which means that the Bible is our final authority, you have to be able to come to grips with the fact that there are some things that we believe as Americans, that we've been taught as uh, 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 patriots, that are not found in the Bible. And religious liberty is one of them. A separation of church and state is not a concept found in Scripture. And I know people get this idea that everything the Founding Fathers wrote was based off Scripture, but that is not true. And you say, well, well, how can that be? Well, let me give you some examples. We're there in Exodus chapter 20. Now, please understand this. Exodus chapter 20 is Scripture. It's the Word of God. It's the Holy Scriptures. But it's also law. Exodus chapter 20 and Leviticus and Numbers in Deuteronomy were the law. That's what it's called biblically. It's referred to itself as in the Bible as the law. Was the law. Now, it's not called the law just because it's kind of just some fancy spiritual term. It's called the law because these were actually the law of the land for the nation of Israel. See, when God established a uh, nation. People get this idea. They say, we, we, uh, they'll say, well, if God established a nation, uh, it'd be just like America. Well, wait a minute. Here's the problem with that. God did establish a nation. It's called the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, the children of Israel in the Old Testament. And it's not hard for us to go back and see if God, if God, theoretically, not a theory, if God established a nation, what would that nation look like? Hey, open the Old Testament. It's easy to see. In Exodus chapter 20, God, God is giving uh, uh, the children of Israel the, ten, the first 10 initial laws, the most important law. Now, there's more laws to come, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But he says, look, just to get you started, they just came out of Egypt. He's establishing a new nation. And he says, just to get you started, let me give you the first 10 commandments. These are not spiritual commands necessarily. They are spiritual commands. But this was the law of the land. This is what the nation of Israel was to follow. So let me ask you this question. When we look at the, I mean, I just read to you the first, the first amendment of the U.S. Constitution. You, you can't establish religion. You can't keep people from exercising whatever religion they want. Now let's read the first commandment of God's founding documents for the nation of Israel. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, thou shall have no other gods before me. Does that sound like religious liberty to you? The first amendment you can worship whatever God you want. The first commandment, you can't worship any God other than the God of the Bible. Amen. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let's look at the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And the second commandment is divided into two parts. The first part is found in verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. The second part is found in verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation, unto them that hate me. So we're, we're two commandments into the federal law that God is giving the nation, the newly established nation of Israel, and they're both religious, and they're not freedom of religion. They're, thou shalt not have any other gods before me, and by the way, you can't make unto thee any graven images and bow yourself down to them. Let's look at the third one. Look at verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You can't walk around saying, oh my Fill in the blank. And by the way, let me just say this. Christians, you shouldn't walk around saying, oh my, because you stubbed your toe. That's taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We are only to use the name of God when talking about God or referring to God. We're not to use his name as a curse word. And he says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That sounds like a pretty religious law. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And again, that was a religious observance that they held in the Old Testament of keeping the Sabbath. Here's what's interesting. You've got ten commandments. The first four are religious, and they're not religious freedom. 
They're, if anything, anti-religious freedom. He's saying, you can't worship whatever God you want. You can't worship whatever idol you want. You can't just take the name of the Lord, the God, in vain. You can't just uh, uh, remember the Sabbath. God says, look, and here's all I'm trying to explain to you, and here's all I'm trying to help you understand. The concept, the concept of religious liberty. You say, Pastor, you're a Baptist preacher. Are you really preaching against religious liberty? Excuse me for preaching the Bible. I'm not preaching against religious liberty or saying that we need to get rid of it. Look, there's, there's lots of things that need to be done in the United States of America before we get back to the Bible, okay? But please understand this. Just get this. Just acknowledge this. Just admit this. Religious liberty is not a concept found in the Bible. God, God did not tell the children of Israel, you have the freedom to worship whatever God you want. The first amendment. Oh, no, excuse me. The first commandment says you don't have the freedom. To worship whatever God you want. And you say, well, I don't know. I mean, the Ten Commandments, that's kind of just, um, you know, maybe that was just more symbolic. Okay, go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. You're there in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Bible does not teach separation of church and state. God didn't say, hey, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments, but I'm not going to mention myself because I believe that government should be separate from God. No, he says, in fact, the first four commandments are all about me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He doesn't, the Bible doesn't believe in separating God from government. And the Bible does not teach religious liberty. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Look at verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 6, the Bible says this. Again, we're in the law aspect of the Bible, the laws of the nation of Israel. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. Now, wait a minute. First of all, why is, why, is, why is he enticing you secretly? Don't you have freedom of religion? And the answer is no. In the nation of Israel, there was no freedom of religion. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then God says, but look, let me just spell it out for you in the law. If someone tries to entice thee secretly, saying, let us go serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, look at verse 7, namely, of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent. The word consent means to agree or give permission. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken, that means to listen unto him, neither shall thine eye pity, you shouldn't even feel sorry for him, neither shalt thou spare, you should not make any exceptions for him, neither shalt thou conceal him, you should not hide him, you should not help him, you should not uh, 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 give him help in this, verse 9, but thou shalt surely kill him. Say, well, wait a minute. well, I mean, I have religious liberty is from the Bible. No, you turn, it's from the founding fathers, but you didn't get it from the Bible. But thou shalt surely kill them. Thy hand shall be first upon them. I'm just, you say, I don't like this. Well, look, you're, we're reading the Bible. I'm sorry, if the Bible makes you uncomfortable, there's something wrong with you. So are you saying we should kill people? Look, I'm not saying that. We don't live under the, na- the rules of the nation of Israel, the laws of the nation of Israel. And if you're confused by that, come back next week. We're going we're gonna to talk about how we as Christians should live in a government that is non-Christian. We're going to look at that. And I'm not saying that it's our job to uphold the laws of the Old Testament. If God were to establish a nation, I wonder how he would do Oh, wait, I don't have to wonder. I can- God did establish a government. God did establish a nation. And I can just look at what he said and tell you what he thinks about it. Here's how God feels about it. Verse 10. Thou shalt stone him with stones, that he die. Well, look at verse 9. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones, that he die, because he had sought to 
thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as is among you. Look at verse uh, 5 of, of, of the chapter there. Notice he says, And the prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shall thou put the evil away uh, from the midst of thee. And please understand me, I'm just going to say this, although it doesn't matter how many times I say this, because people take my uh, sermons out of context to, you know, push their agendas. But I am not standing up here telling you, we need to enforce the laws of God uh, in a government that doesn't hold to the laws of God. Jesus didn't believe that. Paul didn't believe that. I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible uh, tomorrow. I'm going to, or not tomorrow, good night. Uh, I'm going to prove to you next week. I'm going to show you as Christians living under a non-Christian government, excuse me for saying that, that's the government you live under, where we, where we obey, where we don't obey, you know, and, and, and the fact that we don't take God's laws and, 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 um, you know, execute them ourselves. There are things that God gave government to do, and this was one of them. This was not. Uh, this was something that they, that was that was sanctioned by the government. It's in their federal law. The nation of Israel. You're not allowed to worship the Lord. Well, what's the punishment? Death. And, and and I'm showing this to you just to show you that the concept of religious liberty is not found in the Bible. The Bible does not teach separation of church and state. The Bible does not teach religious liberty. And, and, and excuse me uh, for saying this because, you know, today you listen to patriotic pastors and Christians and they make statements like this. Well, I don't like what you have to say, but I'll die for you to say it. Oh, really? Is Because that's what the Bible says? I don't like you taking the name of the Lord my God in vain, but I'll send my kids to across the ocean to die to give you the right to say that. You got that from, I don't know where you got that from, but you didn't get it from the Bible. I don't like the God you worship, but I'll die to give you the freedom to worship that God. Excuse me, I'm not sending my kids across the ocean to die. I forgot, I didn't see it in the Bible. Maybe you can show it to me where the Bible says that I'm supposed to send my kids. And look, you say, ah, you're anti-military. I'm a veteran. Maybe that gives me the right to say this. I'm not sending my kids across an ocean to give a Hindu the right to worship his idol. I, I, I miss that in the Bible where I'm supposed to send my kids off to die to give a Muslim the right to worship his false god, to give the Hindu the right to worship his false god, to give the atheist the right to worship no god. You didn't get that from the Bible. Amen. Religious liberty, the concept, is not found in Scripture. You can say it's constitutional. You can say it's patriotic. You can uh, have a piece of apple pie and say God bless America, but you didn't get it from the Bible. Separation of church and state is not the concept found in Scripture. The Bible does not teach separation of church and state. The Bible does not teach religious liberty. Some people are already offended, and that's fine. Welcome to Verity Baptist Church, what we do best. <laughs> Let me offend you even further, patriots. Separation of church and state is not only not a concept found in Scripture, point number one. Here's point number two. Separation of church and state is not even a concept found in our Constitution. Separation of church and state is not even something, the way that it's applied today is not even a concept that was meant to be applied the way it is. Now let's just talk, let me give you a little bit of a history lesson. Where did the phrase separation of church and state come from? Many Americans, and we won't take a survey this morning, but if you were to ask the average American, where are written these words, separation of church and state, the average American would say, I don't know, the, the Constitution? Most people, when surveyed, think the phrase separation of church and state is found in the Constitution. It's not. I don't know, the Declaration of Independence? Most people think the, the, the phrase separation of church and state is found somewhere in our founding documents. It's not. You say, where, is the, where does that phrase come from, separation of church and state? Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter when he was president Responding to the Danbury Baptist Association, the Danbury Baptists in the early 1800s had written the new president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, and a letter, and their concerns were that Thomas Jefferson was going to lead or allow 
for a development of a national denomination, something similar to what England had with the uh, Anglican Church, what we call the Anglican Church, they call the Church of England. And they, they had some concerns about that, so they wrote the newly appointed president asking, you know, are we going to be protected from having a national denomination imposed upon us by the government? Here's what Thomas Jefferson wrote back in a personal letter that he wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association. He said, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach only reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declare that their legislators should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. See, that phrase, separation of church and state, building a wall of separation between the church and state, was not, is not found in the Constitution, is not found in the Declaration of Independence, is not found in any uh, founding fa- uh, document of this country. It's from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptists saying, hey, you don't have to worry about us, about us establishing a uh, federal denomination. The First Amendment, and he's referring to the First Amendment, he says, you know, does not allow us to establish a federal religion. And he used this phrase, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Now you say, well, well, it sounds then like separation of church and state is connected uh, to religious liberty. And, and here's what I want you to understand, okay? First of all, where that phrase came from, it didn't come from any fun, founding documents. It came from a personal letter written by the president to Thomas Jefferson to uh, the Danbury Baptist Association. But let me help you understand how the First Amendment was originally intended to be interpreted. And again, I, I'm not a huge, you know, just God bless America patriot. I love America as the nation I live in, and I love Americans, and I don't want them to die and go to hell. But my allegiance is to God. I preached that sermon last week. I'm not going to re-preach it again. But I think it's wise for us to try to understand, when, when, when the founders gave us these documents, how did they originally intend for those documents to be interpreted? The founders, and please understand this, defined the words church and religion as a specific denomination, not generally speaking about God or Christianity in general. Now, I'm going to read to you some quotes from a book uh, here. It's called Original Intent, by, written by David Barr, and actually Brother Todd gave me the book, and it's, it's, it's pretty good. I like it. I'm going to give you some quotes uh, from that book. Here's what it says. The records are succinct. They clearly document that the founder's purpose for the First Amendment is not compatible with the interpretation given it, given it by contemporary courts. The founders intended only to prevent the establishment of a single national denomination, not to restrain public religious expression. So please understand this. Today, starting at about the 1960s, the federal government and the Supreme Court, and I'll probably be preaching about that in a few weeks in a sermon called Injustice for All, but the, the, the federal court government, especially the Supreme Court, decided that the religious liberty clauses of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause meant that we're not allowed to have God in any sort of public arena. That there, you, there can be no mention of God. There can be no mention of the Bible. There can be no mention of Christianity uh, in government at all. And they point back and they'll say, you know, separation of church and state. The problem with that is that when you read the records from the founding era, it's extremely clear that the First Amendment is not compatible with the interpretation given it by contemporary courts. The founders intended only to prevent establishment of a single denomination, not to restrain public religious expression. Again, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with that. I'm just telling you that's what the founders meant by the religious liberty wording in the First Amendment. And by the way, this is why 
for the first 150, 190 years of our nation's, of our nation's existence, there was public acknowledgement of God and Christianity allowed and even promoted all over the place. I mean, the, 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 the United States Supreme Court has the Ten Commandments written in stone on a wall. <laughs> you know, but today we're told, oh, no, you can't have anything that's biblical. You can't, the founding fathers, you know, separation of church and state, we're not supposed to have anything that has anything to do with God in, in, public, in a public arena or in a public uh, uh, setting. That is not what was originally intended. Now, I'm not even agreeing that what was originally intended came from the Bible. Do you, do you understand that? But I'm, I'm definitely stating that what they've turned it into today is not even what they originally intended. The original intent, when the founding fathers spoke the word church or religion, what they were referring to was a denomination. We're not going to make the Presbyterian church the church of the United States of America. The Anglican church, the church. They wanted to restrain a federal national denomination, not restrain public religious expressions, not restrain God or Christianity in general. Here's another quote from the book. The separation idiom appeared in only two cases in the Supreme Court's first 150 years. So understand this. For the first 150 years of laws being passed and uh, cases being brought to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court referenced Thomas Jefferson's Separation of Church and State, two times. The separation idiom appeared only in only two cases in the Supreme Court's first 150 years, yet over the past 50 years, it has been cited in seemingly countless number of court decisions. So there's a problem here with how the original intent and the application of that phrase is today. Go, go to Psalms, back to Psalms if you would, Psalm 33. I'm, kind of, I'm giving you three thoughts uh, to consider. Number one, separation of church and state is not a concept found in Scripture. The Bible does not teach separation of church and state. The Bible does not teach religious liberty. Now, look, you can like that or not like that or whatever. You can say, well, that's the law that needs to be brought in the land. And, hey, if we could vote it in, I'd vote it in. Let me tell you something. If we could vote in the laws of God, I would vote in all of them. Amen. The law of the Lord is perfect. And here's the funny thing, just hearing some people, I say that and they think like, I can't, I would never. We should always have religious liberty. Look, if, you, if I could live under the, the laws of the Old Testament, I would. And by the way, let me just explain something to you. If you plan on being saved and, and being part of the millennial reign, guess what the laws of the land are going to be? The laws of God. Amen. Goodbye to the First Amendment. It's not going to be there. And if that offends you, then you know what? The Bible offends you. The Bible does not teach separation of church and state. The Bible does not teach religious liberty. The concept of, of separation of church and state is not even a concept that's found in the Constitution. It's a phrase that came out of a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote, and it's not how America interpreted that phrase or interpreted the First Amendment for the first 150 years of our existence. Number three. Separation of church and state, not only is it not a concept found in Scripture, not only is it not a concept found in the Constitution, separation of church and state, number three, is not a concept practiced by our government. Not only is it not found in the Constitution, it's not even practiced by our government. Psalm 33, look at verse 12, notice what the Bible says. Blessed is the nation. We saw this last week. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The Bible doesn't say blessed is the nation that separates itself from God and makes sure that religion and government never mix. That's not what it says. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Separation of church and state, that concept, is not practiced by our government. They misuse that concept, separation of state, by not allowing religious activity, Christian activity, God-centered activity. But the problem with that is that for the first 150 years, almost 200 years, from 1776 to 1962, 
expressing God, prayer, in the public school, all those things were fine. It was constitutional. No problem. And then in the 1960s, which, you know, if you know anything about the 1960s, was not a good time for our country. A wicked time for our country. In the 1960s, the Supreme Court, nine unelected governing, you know, officials, decided, no, we're going to make the First Amendment mean something different. We're going to interpret it different. And all sorts of stupid rulings and, and concepts that came forth uh, since that time. I'm going to read to you, uh, you know, just bear with me. I'm going to read to you a list of these, and this is from the original intent uh, book. Read to you some of the rulings that have uh, been given since 1960 in regards to this. A verbal prayer offered in a school is unconstitutional even if that prayer is both voluntary and denomina, domin, uh, denominationally neutral. That was ruled at Engel versus uh, Vitali, 1962, Abington versus Scamp, 1963, Commissioner of Education versus School Committee of Leyden, 1971. Here's another example. Freedom of speech and press are guaranteed to students and teachers unless the topic is religious, at which time such speech becomes unconstitutional. That was the ruling, uh, uh, Stain versus Oshinsky, 1965, Collins versus Chandler Unified School District, 1981, Bishop versus Aroni, 1991, Duran versus Nietzsche, 1991. Here's another example. It is unconstitutional for students to see the Ten Commandments since they might read, meditate upon, respect, or obey them. That was the ruling, Stone versus Graham, 1980. Ring versus Grand Forks Public School District, 1980. Lanner versus Wimmer, 1981. If a student prays over his lunch, it is unconstitutional for him to pray aloud. Reed versus Van Hoven, 1965. A school song was struck down because it promoted values such as honesty, truth, courage, faith, in the form of a prayer. Interestingly, the song occurred as a part of voluntary extracurricular study, uh, student activities, Doe versus Aldine Independent School District, 1982. It is unconstitutional for a war memorial to be erected in the shape of a cross, Lowe versus City of Eugene, 1969. The Ten Commandments, despite the fact that they are the basis of civil law and are depicted in engraved stone in the U.S. Supreme Court may not be displayed at a public courthouse, Harvey versus Cobb County, 1993. When a student addresses an assembly of his peers, he effectively becomes a government representative. It is therefore unconstitutional for that student to engage in prayer, Harris versus Joint School District, 1994. It is unconstitutional for a public cemetery to have a planter in the shape of a cross, for if someone were to view that cross, it could cause emotional distress and thus constitute an injury in fact, Warshaw versus Tecapi, 1990. Even though the wording may be constitutionally acceptable, a bill becomes unconstitutional if the legislator who introduced the bill had a religious activity in his mind when it was um, authored. Wallace versus Jeffries, 1985. Now, now they're wanting to legislate what you think. It is unconstitutional for a classroom library to contain books which deal with Christianity or for a teacher to be seen with a personal copy of the Bible at school, Robert versus Madigan, 1990. It is unconstitutional for a board of education to use or refer to the word God in any of its official writings, Ohio versus Wisner, 1976. In a city seal composed of numerous symbols representing various aspects of the community, here's some examples, industry, its commerce, its history, its flora, its schools, it is unconstitutional for any of those symbols to depict the religious heritage or any religious element of the community. Robin versus City of Edmond, 1995. Harris versus City of Zion, 1991. City of Zion. It's called City of Zion. <laughs> and they're like, no religious activity. Kuhn versus City of Rolling Meadows, 1991. Friedman versus Board of County Commissioners, 1985. It is unconstitutional for school officials to be publicly praised or recognized in an open community meeting if that meeting is sponsored by a religious group, Jane Doe versus Santa Fe Independent School District, 1995. 
Artwork may not be displayed in schools if it depicts something religious, even if that artwork is considered an historical classic, uh, Wash Glisek versus Bloomingdale Public School, 1993. It is unconstitutional for a kindergarten class to ask whose birthday is celebrated by Christmas, Flory versus Sioux Falls School District, 1979. And you really think that's what the Founding Fathers thought when they added the First Amendment? That kindergartners shouldn't be able to ask, You know, what is Christmas about? It is unconstitutional for a school graduation ceremony to contain an opening or closing prayer. Harris versus Joint School District, 1994. Guerin versus Ludon County School Board, 1993. Lee uh, Lee versus Wiseman, 1992. Kay versus Douglas School District, 1986. Graham versus Central Community School District, 1985. It is unconstitutional for a nativity uh, scene to be displayed on public property, and I'm not necessarily for nativity scenes, I'm just reading what it says, uh, unless surrounded by sufficient secular displays to prevent it from appearing religious. County of Allegheny versus ACLU, 1989. And we could go on, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to, continue to bore you with that. The point is this, that the, the idea of separation of state was not something that was practiced by our government, by our government. From 1776 to 1962, 1960s, praying in schools, reading your Bible in public, acknowledging God were all things that were allowed. And, and look, and I'm not saying that they got that from the Bible because the Bible doesn't even teach religious liberty, but I will tell you this, our country was a much better country back then. They misused the concept of separation of church and state by not allowing religious activity that allows for almost 200 years of our nation's history. So I said, number one, it is not a concept found in scripture. Number two, it is not a concept found in the constitution. Number three, it is not a concept even practiced by our government. It wasn't practiced, it wasn't practiced by our government for the first 150, 180, 190 years of our nation's history. And since the 1960s, it's been twisted and interpreted to say, no God nowhere at any time ever. You can't acknowledge God. You can't, I mean, you can't post the Ten Commandments at a courthouse. Because they're afraid, they're afraid, and I didn't read this one to you, they, they're, they're afraid that during a murder, during a murder hearing, during a hearing of a murder, of a violent murder, they're afraid that if the jury were to walk by a monument that had the Ten Commandments, they might read the words, thou shalt not kill, and that would influence them. That's the country you and I live in. So excuse me if I'm not that into your patriotic uh, celebrations. Separation of church and state is not a concept practiced by our government. But let me say this. It's not a concept that was practiced at the beginning of our government. It's been misused and mistreated and misinterpreted to do something much different than the original intent. But let me just explain something to you. It's not a concept. It's not a concept practiced by our government today. Today, our government does not separate itself from church, religion, God, or state. You say, well, how can that be? I mean, they don't allow us to pray in public. They don't allow us to read scripture in public. They don't allow us. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They don't allow us to reach into government. See, here's the funny thing. When Thomas Jefferson, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the word separation of church and state, that the Constitution builds a wall between uh, separating the church and state, here's what he meant. He meant... That wall does not allow government to reach into church. But church, through its influence of the people, can reach into government. Today, they have interpreted it this way. They said, no, that wall does not allow church, church people, Bible-believing Christians, to reach into government. But the government can reach all day into church. See, if they wanted to say, hey, let's have separation of church and state, I, I honestly, I'd say, hey, I'd rather follow the gods of the Bible, but I'll take, I'll take separation of church and state if you're actually going to separate yourself from us. Well, oh, separation of church and state. Well, here's the problem. The government, the government does not practice separation of church and state. 
Because they reach into church and the Bible and my beliefs all the time. You say, how can that be? Well, when they create legislation on the definition of marriage, they are reaching into my religious liberty. They are reaching into my religious beliefs. When they create legislation on abortion, they reach into my religious beliefs. When they create legislation on vaccines, they reach into my religious beliefs. When they create legislation on homeschooling, they reach into my religious beliefs. When they create legislation against uh, uh, disciplining your children and spanking your children, they reach into my religious belief. When they create legislation like they just did earlier this month in the state of California, basically just making pedophilia legal, they reach into my religious beliefs. When they sue gov- uh, churches for assembling, they reach into my religious belief. So here's the problem with separation of church and state. And here's the problem with the religious liberty is that they can reach into us all day, every day, anytime they want, but we can't reach into them. No, I'm not signing up for that. Keep your pledge of allegiance. I'll just have allegiance to God. See, they, 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 they say separation of church and state. They say separation of church and state. And I might sign up for separation of church and state if they actually left us alone but they don't. What they mean, what they mean, go to the book of Micah, if you would, Micah chapter 4, towards the end of the Old Testament, you have the minor prophets. If you head backwards from the last uh, book in the Old Testament, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, you have those Z-H-C-H books, then Nahum and Micah. Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Nahum, Micah. See, what they mean by separation of church and state is this, you Christians stay over there and don't influence us and don't try to talk to us and don't try to have anything to do with us, but we'll reach over that wall anytime we want and mess with you. Create laws against you. Do things against you. See, religious, uh, separation of religious aid, it wasn't practiced when our nation was first founded, when they allowed Christians to Worship God in public, and it's not practiced today when they fight Christians and they create laws. Look, make, make you, you, know, you, you have to pay 100 senators and 237 or 240 or whatever the number is, congressmen, you got to pay them a full-time salary to create laws. You know, no wonder we have a million laws. When you make somebody's job, their full-time job to create laws, they're going to create laws. You know, let them, let them create whatever laws they want about the speed limit. Let them create whatever laws they want about roads. And let them create whatever laws they want about uh, bridges. I don't care about that. But don't reach into what I believe. Start creating laws about my family. Start creating laws about our church. Start creating law. See, so you say, well, no, pastor, pastor, you know, you can't sit there and try to make it sound like God's not for freedom of speech. Hey, let me tell you something. God, in the Bible, God wasn't for freedom of speech. Certain things you said will put you to death. You say, but pastor, you can't say that because they're going to use that against us. Uh, newsflash, they're using it against us. They're already using it against us. There already is no freedom of speech. Anybody can say anything they want as long as you don't say what the Bible says. Well, you know what? Forget you. I'm not for your freedom of speech. I'm going to say what the Bible says, whether you like it or not. And I don't get my right from your constitution. I get it from God. You say, oh, well, the constitution, not to your constitution. Here's my constitution, the word of God. I don't need permission from you. I don't need help from you. I don't need you to acknowledge it. I don't need you to like it. I have my allegiance given to God, period. Well, that's going to make uh, freedom of speech go away. Freedom of speech is gone, friend. That's going to make religious liberty go away. Religious liberty is on its way out. You say, well, what do we do? What do we do? Well, you come back next week. I'll explain to you. <laughs> I can't. You know, I got I to gotta, I gotta make you want to come back. Our job as Christians, our job as Christians, I'll give you a little preview into next week's sermon. Our job as Christians is to disobey unbiblical laws. Now this means, this means that we need to understand government's true limited authority, and it means that we need to obey government 
when it's exercising its true government authority. Now, the problem is that some people hear me preach like this, and they think, okay, so we're anti-government all the time. Let's burn our masks. Wait a minute. God gave limited authority to government. Say, so, well, when should we obey and when should we not obey? Well, you don't get to just make that decision. God explains that to us. And what you and I as Christians need to understand is what is the limited authority that God has given government so that we can obey that limited authority and so that we can know when we should obey government. Because the Bible actually says that. The Bible actually uses that phrase to obey the powers that be. But there are other times when we say, no, we're going to obey God rather than men. When do we do that? When do we cross that line? We'll learn that next week. Next week, I'm going to preach a sermon called Christian Civil Disobedience. This means that you and I need to understand government's limited authority, and when we are to obey and when we are not to obey, and we'll talk about that next week. But let me just go ahead and say this. Our job, our job, and the First Amendment actually says this too, you know, and I'm not saying it because the First Amendment said I'm just saying they got this one right. Our job as Christians is not only to know when we should and we should not obey government. Our job as Christians is not only to know when we should and when we should not get involved in the laws of the land. We'll talk about that next week. But I'll just say this. Our job as Christians is to rebuke government. We need... Um, and op- and we, we need to, as Christians, open people's eyes to the truth. Are you there in Micah chapter 4, verse 3? Last, last verse we'll look at. Micah chapter 4, verse 3. And he shall judge. Now, this is about the millennial reign, okay? So I'm showing you. I showed you verses of the first time God established government. Now I'm going to show you verses about the next time God established government. And this is true of Bible-believing people all throughout. And he shall judge among many people, notice, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And of course, this is about the millennial reign. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And of course, the communists have taken that phrase and tried to use it to push their communist agenda. But this is the millennial reign. But he says, and rebuke strong nations afar off. When you read the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, you know all those, verse, all those chapters you like to skip? All the chapters that we actually preach through here, all those chapters in Ezekiel, all those chapters in Isaiah. You know what you find? You find that chapter after chapter after chapter, the prophets are just rebuking nation after nation. Have you noticed that? They're just like, now let me tell you about Egypt. And then it's like, now let me tell you about this, these heathens. Let me tell you about those heathens. And just rebuking nation after nation. See, we need to know, we'll talk about it next week, when to step in, when to not step in, when to obey, when to not obey. And I'll explain that to you next week. We'll look at it in a sermon called Christian Civil Disobedience. But let me just say this. You say, I don't really like this uh, study, Pastor. It doesn't make me feel, you know, very patriotic. Well, here's the thing. It's our job as Christians to rebuke governments, rebuke kings, rebuke kingdoms when they overstep, when they overreach, when they do things. Look, it's our job. When they overstep into things that God says, you don't have any authority there, friend, then we disobey and we rebuke. We disobey and we rebuke. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say we take up arms. You didn't get that from the Bible either. I didn't, I didn't say, you know, well, let's create a militia. Let's all shave our heads and get a militia going. No, that's not, no, you didn't get that from the Bible. Show me that in the Bible. Yeah, I missed that chapter. Right after the parable of the sower, then Jesus, you know, said, let's get a militia. Yeah, I missed that one. Actually, Jesus said the opposite. When are you going to establish your kingdom, Jesus? Ah, don't worry about that. That's called the millennial reign. I'll worry about that. But you shall receive power. You say, what do we do as Christians? We need to know when to obey. We need to know when to not obey. We need to know when to engage. We need to know when not to engage. And we need to know when to rebuke. And let me tell you something. Today, Christians are failing at the rebuke part. Because in their hatred, in their hatred, conservative Christian people, in their hatred for the Democrats and Joe Biden, 
They're giving the Republicans and Donald Trump a free pass. And let me tell you something, that's wrong. It's not of God. It's not of God. It's never right for us to do wrong. In fact, Paul said, is it right for you to do wrong that good may come of it? Look, it's never right to sin, period. And today, people are like, well, yeah, but I mean, Joe Biden is so bad. And Joe Biden is bad. But you know what? So is Donald Trump. And the, and the, Demo- the, the Democratic Party is wicked as hell. But you know what? So is the Republican Party. And I'm out this close, and I don't think I'm going to do it. I'm out this close to preaching a sermon called God's Not a Republican. <laughs> and then I'm going to follow it up with a sermon called Satan is a Democrat. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that we should not put our trust in princess. We should not put our trust in politicians. We should not put our trust in man. We should put our trust in God. And we take the Bible and we say, okay, well, how does God want me to live in this country? And we'll look at it. You know what? Here's the beautiful thing. Jesus lived under the Roman Empire. Jesus did not live under the laws of Moses. And Jesus actually taught us how to live in a government that is wicked that is not following the laws of God. So we'll look at that next week. I encourage you to come back as we continue the series, Mixing Politics and Religion. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Lord, thank you for the fact that we don't have to guess. We really don't have to guess what you think about X, Y, or Z. We just need to, we need to just open up the Bible and read it. We need to just put down the newspaper, sign out of Facebook, X out of YouTube, and read the Bible. And Lord, I thank you that there's clarity in Scripture. And Lord, I pray that this sermon will be taken in the spirit in which is given. Lord, obviously we don't hate people. We love people. We want to see people saved. But the government we're living in is not a government that we should be pushing or promoting It's not a government that we should be laying our hands on and affirming. It is a government that we should be rebuking as Bible-believing Christians. And Lord, I pray that more Christians would wake up and realize that I am a Christian first and everything else comes later. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen.